Okay, next talk is entitled Sparse Polynomial Learning and Graph Sketching. Authors are Kuklaglu, Shinmangam, Damakis, and Clivens. Talk given by Damakis. So, uh, I will talk about sparse polynomial learning. Uh, this is joint work with my students, Murat and Kartik, uh, who are here, and uh, I'm Alex and uh, Adam, and we're all from UT Austin. So the problem we're interested in is uh, learning sparse polynomials. So we'll be working with functions that take uh, as an input n bits. So here I have you know minus one, plus one, minus one, minus one. And uh, they produce as an output a real number. Uh, so all functions, though, so these are we, sometimes they're called functions over the hypercube from minus one up to one to the n. And all of them can be written as the linear terms, so c1x1 plus c2x2, et cetera, plus the pairwise terms, plus the three terms, et cetera. And there will be basically one uh, unknown uh, coefficient, which is called sometimes parse, uh, so it was called the Fourier coefficient, for each subset of variables. So there's two to the n unknown coefficients. Uh, now, we'll be interested in sparse polynomials, so we will have uh, s only that are non zero. A special case uh, is when the output of this function is also minus one plus one, and these are sometimes called Boolean valued functions. This is the objects that are studied in classical learning theory. So here's an example. Let's say that I would like to learn this function here, 3x2 plus 2x1, x2, x3. I don't know this. Uh, what I know is there's a monkey somewhere that flips a bunch of coins, and the monkey flips plus plus minus, and tells me where for plus plus minus the function evaluates to one. And for plus plus plus, you see the function evaluates to two plus three, uh, three plus two, which is five. Whereas for minus minus plus, the function evaluates to minus three uh, plus two, which is minus one, right? So I see uh, these random examples, and I need to learn the coefficients. And I know that there is s uh, of them that are non-zero. Uh, so who cares? Uh, well, there are several interesting applications of this problem. Uh, so in particular, the paper, recent paper by Stobe and Andreas Krause, uh, discusses two of them. One is learning an unknown graph from uh, cuts, uh, and the second one is approximating submodular uh, functions for uh, submodular optimization, and both of them use this problem of learning sparse polynomials as a uh, routine. Now, the bad news uh, is that this problem is very, very hard. Uh, so there's a classical learning theory problem that's called learning juntas. Now, a junta is a, a function that depends only on k variables. So if a function depends on k variables, it can have at most you know, 2 to the k terms. So s is 2 to the k. And uh, the output is Boolean 2, which is a special case of what we're discussing. And learning juntas is, is a, a huge open problem in classical learning theory. So uh, learning it in polynomial time would be a big breakthrough. Uh, in this paper, we don't uh, achieve that. Uh, what we actually achieve is we say that we can learn almost all sparse polynomials uh, in polynomial time. Uh, so that's, that's the main sort of high level uh, result we have. Uh, of course, uh, none of the sparse polynomials we learn are actually Boolean-valued Boolean functions. They will be real-valued functions. So uh, the previous state of the art can learn sparse polynomials in, uh, a pol using a polynomial number of samples. S is the sparsity, N is the number of variables. So this is a paper by Krause and Stobe. An independent work by Sahan Negaban and Devavra Shah uh, has a different dependency on uh, the number of samples. But the problem with both of these papers is that they are exponential time. Uh, the running time is exponential. And the key idea in both of them is understanding that learning a sparse polynomial is really a problem of, of compressed sensing, but in exponentially high dimension. So let's understand that a little bit. Uh, so I have here my function 3x2 plus 2x1, x2, x3, and I don't know the function. I see this data. I see that on plus, plus, minus, it gives me a 1. Plus, plus, plus gives me a 5, et cetera. Now, I can take all the monomials, so these are the n monomials x1, x2, x3, and then the products, and then the triplets, and evaluate my input plus, plus, minus on these, on these 2 to the n points. So I know that my function on plus, plus, minus evaluates to 1. And I can write this now as this long vector, 
multiplied by this coefficient vector, which in my example here has only two non-zero terms. Uh, it has a three at this, at the second coordinate, and it has a two at the last coordinate, right? And uh, when I take the dot product of these things, I am evaluating my function, and I, I know that this is a one. So this is a problem where I have linear equations on an unknown vector. The problem is that the vector has two to the n unknown, so it's a very long vector, and I can't get polynomial, I can't get a linear number of measurements. So this is a compressed sensing problem, finding a, a sparse solution to an underdetermined system of linear equations. Uh, and as I said, C lives in dimension big N is two to the N. So now one thing you, could, you can prove here, and that's what the previous works have shown, is that this measurement matrix here is, uh, is a good compressed sensing matrix. Uh, and remember that uh, this is not IID plus minus one, so the monkey chooses the first, the x1, x2, xn, but the rest are fully determined afterwards. So this is not an IID, a completely independent matrix. But still, uh, this paper uh, was able to show that this matrix has RIP, and that's how they get their sample complexity. And uh, the second paper by Negaban and Shah actually shows incoherence, which means the dot product between any two columns is going to be small. So that's how they get their uh, different sample complexity. But of course, both problems at the end of the day need to solve a compressed sensing problem uh, in exponential dimension, so the, the running time is going to be exponential. So here is our main result. So we say that there's a function from minus one to plus one to the reals, which is S sparse, and it's going to be a linear combination of these S uh, functions that we call here, these we call parities, okay? So I will sometimes call them parities because I'm a coding theorist, so. Uh, these are S parities. Uh, the main result, the main theorem, is that we can learn any such function in time polynomial in n, n2 to the s, using uh, n times 2 to the s samples under the following conditions. So here's one example. If the coefficients, the unknown coefficients, are in general position. General position means, for example, that uh, the devil chooses a sparse polynomial. I can learn that. But if I add a little bit of noise to the coefficients, Gaussian noise, let's say, with any variance, then almost surely I can learn the perturbed uh, polynomial. So in that sense, I can learn almost all sparse polynomials. Uh, the second situation that we can learn, for example, is when all the coefficients are non-negative. Uh, so, or, you know, the non-zero ones are positive. Then I will show, actually, in this talk that we can easily learn those. Uh, the third case, is if the sets of parities are chosen uniformly at random. So there are several other situations where we can learn, and all of them come from one key idea, really. And this is the key idea that, that I want to explain, the unique sign property. So uh, this is the property that we use, and we say this unique sign property holds for several families of sparse polynomials, including learning uh, graphs from cuts, learning hypergraphs from cuts, and all the previous cases that I mentioned, so no negative and random and all those. And all our proofs go through this USP condition. Uh, unfortunately, uh, if your function is Boolean valued, so if your output is also plus minus one, the USP condition will not hold. So that means, you know, if you're a classical learning theorist, you shouldn't quit your day job just yet because we haven't actually uh, solved the classical learning theory problem of learning a Boolean valued function. But still, all these learning graphs and learning hypergraph functions are interesting even though they are not Boolean value. Okay, so uh, the key technology we use is really coding theoretic. Uh, and what we do is we, we limit the two to the n search space into a space that is only two to the s. And then basically we solve a compressed sensing problem in this space that's uh, much more manageable. Okay, now I want to explain to you the unique sign property. When can I learn a sparse polynomial? So my condition says that when my function obtains its maximum value, so this function will obtain, so at, you, know, you plug in a bunch of random bits, it will give you numbers, there will be a maximum number that will spit out for several inputs. Uh, what I need is that for all these inputs, the signs of the parity, so this chi1 is a product of x1 times x3 maybe, right? And this one is x1, x2, x7 or something. I, and these will be plus one or minus one. What I need is when the maximum value is obtained, the signs of all of these are uniquely determined. That's the key property I need. Let's understand why this property holds when the coefficients are non-negative. 
So I have some unknown sparse polynomial, and what I see is this, right? On plus plus, minus, it gives me a one. On plus plus plus, gives me a five. On minus plus, minus gives me a 12. Okay. Now, when I see the maximum value, so let's assume I get enough samples to see the maximum value. Well, how many values can this function uh, have? Well, it has s terms, and everyone can be plus or minus, so it will have two to the s at most different values. And if I see, I will see two to the s samples, so I will definitely see the maximum value. Uh, and I claim that for all, every time I see the maximum value, all the parities must be positive. Well, why is that the case? So this is the key thing I, I'd, like to, to, I'd like you to understand. Well, the coefficients, here I'm assuming the coefficients are non-negative, right? So if the coefficients are non-negative and this function is giving me the largest value, then this can only happen when also all these chi's are greater uh, than zero, are actually plus one. So that's the key, that's the reason, that's the proof that the unique sign property is satisfied when the coefficients are all greater or equal to zero. Okay. So basically from this equation, from minus plus minus giving me 12, I can infer that the first parity, this one chi 1, must be greater or equal to 0. In fact, it must be equal to 1, right? Because this is either minus 1 or plus 1. So from one linear, from one uh, real observation here, I am inferring the sign of, of all S uh, parities. Because I know that this must be positive and this must be positive and all of them must be positive. Okay. How do we use the unique sign property? Now, uh, so by the way, these numbers are uh, just random numbers that I wrote down. They, are not, they do not correspond to some unknown sparse polynomials, so don't, confused by, don't be confused by the 12. But these numbers are actual evaluations of a true sparse polynomial, this one here, 3x2 plus 2x1, x2, x3. Uh, but you don't know that. You're trying to learn it from this data, right? How can you use the unique sign property? Uh, First of all, I'm going, to, I'm going to define this first parity involves only x2. So I will have this vector, the p1 vector, is the support, which is just 0, 1, 0. The second parity involves all three variables. So I will denote by p2 is 1, 1, 1. OK. Now, when you see the maximum value, this is the key argument here. When you see the maximum value, you saw that when you plugged minus plus minus into this function, uh, you see the maximum value, which is 5 in this case. That means that both of these x1 and x2, sorry, chi1 and chi2, must be plus 1, right? Uh, that means, basically, that I can tell something about which variables are involved in chi1 and which variables are involved in chi2. Well, the fact that this chi1 is positive, it means that it involves x1, maybe x2, I don't know, but I do know that it must contain an even number of those minus things, right, for it to be plus 1. That's the key idea. And now if you're, if you're a coding theorist, you realize that this is a parity check equation on, on this unknown vector P1, right? So if you know about LDPC codes, for example, this is, this is a parity check. So what I discovered is from the, the maximum value, I got a parity check equation that all my unknown parities must satisfy. That's the, that's the key of, of my argument. So from, uh, I mean, there's a simple way to map that. You, we map minus ones to ones, ones to zeros, and now we say that one, zero, one, this is the, the vector corresponding to the minus plus minus, dot product with the unknown first parity must be equal to zero, and this is a linear equation over GF2, which is basically a parity check equation. Simultaneously from this measurement, I obtain that the second parity must also satisfy the same linear equation. So. The, the key idea is that every time we see the maximum value, we obtain a linear equation in the unknown parities over GF2. So we obtain parity checks in the unknown uh, uh, chi's. So the first idea here is great. Let's just get enough linear equations. How many do we need? Well, every parity involves n variables, right? And there's s parities. So if I could get n times s linearly independent equations, Solve with Gaussian elimination over GF2, and I'm done. Uh, so that was the first idea. Two minutes. Oh, wow. OK. So uh, we cannot get uh, enough linear equations, unfortunately. So there's several technicalities. We can limit the subspace uh, where the vectors lie into an S-dimensional subspace. That's, that's probably the best thing we can do. Then we go back to compressed sensing, and we solve the compressed sensing problem for each case. And also, if you come to the poster, we can handle a little bit of noise, but that's technical. 
Last very quick point. Uh, so how do we use this for learning graphs? Okay, so if there is a graph that is unknown, I know that there is a bunch of vertices, but I don't know the edges. The monkey now will color the vertices plus or minus, and will tell me how many edges go from minus to plus. That's a random cut. And I see a bunch of random cuts, and I would like to learn the function, the, the graph. This turns out to be learning a sparse polynomial, where every entry is going to be a term like this. So you can easily see this, and this is in the uh, paper by Andreas and Stobe. So uh, it will give me a sparse polynomial of degree two, so we can learn graphs this way. And we can also learn hypergraphs, because then we'll just get, if every hyper edge of degree d will give me a polynomial uh, e, uh, that uh, will, involve, will be at most degree d. And the key thing is that all these sparse polynomials that correspond to learning graphs and hypergraphs will satisfy the unique sign property. Uh, and uh, therefore, uh, we can use Gaussian elimination to s reduce the space, and then we use compressed sensing to learn the hypergraphs. Uh, this is just a plot that shows that if you naively try to do compressed sensing, it's terrible very quickly, whereas if you use our algorithm, of course, it's much more scalable, and you can go up to thousands of uh, vertices in your graph. Uh, so, conclusions. So, we have a novel algorithm that can learn many families of sparse polynomials. Uh, we can learn when this condition, the unique sign property condition, is satisfied. We are still investigating what applications this has, but we know that it already there are many cases where we can learn. For example, non-negative uh, sparse polynomials or polynomials coming from cuts of graphs and hypergraphs. Uh, important point, if you are a classical learning theorist, this does not imply anything important, I think, for learning juntas or learning Boolean functions, which means if the output is also plus minus one, you will not have the unique sign property, so that part remains open. The te key technology is mapping this to a coding theory problem. Our sample complexity is exponential in S, uh, which is worse than, uh, than uh, Stobbe and Krause work. Uh, but of course, our running time is polynomial. So the key question that is open is, is it possible to learn in polynomial time, but with polynomial in S samples also? So I think that's an interesting question to investigate. And the applications that I'm most excited about is in learning graphs and learning hypergraphs, and also in approximating submodular functions when their evaluations are uh, complicated, approximate them by a sparse function and evaluate quickly. So I will stop here. Questions? So can the spotlight speakers please come up? Okay, I'll start with the question. So you went through the applications part kind of quickly. Do you want to tell us a bit more about that? Yes. Okay. So the, the standard application that, uh, that we're interested in is having a graph that is unknown uh, and sparse, and uh, we would like to discover the edges. Uh, the measurement model is that I see uh, random, I make partitions, a random partition of the vertices in two classes, and I see the number of edges going from one class to the other. Uh, the applications that we're thinking about this is possibly in computational biology or in neuroscience, where the graph that is unknown is, is a neuron connectivity graph or a voxel interaction graph. And also, a clear application is in uh, privacy in social networks, where if I reveal to you just how many, how many people talk from one group to another, you wouldn't think that you can learn a graph. But if you see enough such cuts, it turns out you can actually learn the graph. Hello, oh, great work. Um, you have mentioned compressed sensing, and it's known that sort of compressed sensing is lower bound for differential privacy. Differential privacy is lower bound for compressed sensing. Have you looked into your lower bounds in terms of maybe some constructions from differential privacy give you lower bounds on learning? Uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, no, I have not done that. The, the, the only thing that I'm really using compressed sensing for is really understanding this slide where 
the, the compressed sensing is learning the coefficients, which is a sparse vector. The, the, the key problem that, that we could think about, because it's an interesting question, is this is a non-standard, highly non-standard compressed sensing problem because the unknown vector is in exponential dimension. So any of the standard methods will be, will be terrible here. So it's possible that it gives something for, for differential privacy, but I'm not sure about that. Thank you. Great work. All right, let's thank the speaker once again.